Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what is algebraic geometry, my very complex analysis bias point of view. And I'm actually not a complex analyst. Anyway, um, um, a lot of modern algebraic geometry, I'm trying to sell a little bit this type of story, comes from st the study of complex manifolds of complex analysis. And we will see another instance of this today. Uh, so maybe one of the first kind of really abstract things you will learn in algebraic geometry is the definition of a sheaf. And I will take my time to do it. So in particular today, we'll kind of see a rough sketch what a sheaf is supposed to be. I'm suppressing a lot of generality. I'm suppressing a lot of definitions. And I'm kind of want to uh, motivate it by looking at complex analysis. Don't worry if you don't know too much about complex analysis. I will kind of recall the main things. But anyway, it might take one, there will be certainly a take two if there's a take one. Um, but today is more like a little bit of a historical overview in some sense, what we should expect and kind of trying to, well, trying to, you could have invented chiefs type of thing. Um, I certainly couldn't have invented chiefs. It's a, bit, it's a bit too tricky. It's nothing you can come up, I think at least, um, during your nap or something. But some people certainly are very smart and they came up with this definition but eventually we we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and even the giants stood on the shoulders of giants, you know? So, um, yeah, so there's some historical motivation where everything comes from and everything, at least as far as I understand it, and roughly how the story is supposed to be told is comes from, well, analysis, but a certain type of analysis, namely complex analysis. Um, so while we enjoy the, <laughs> this nice picture here, of the absolute value of cosine, um, I'm going to explain a little bit what I th how I should think or how I would like you to think um, how this whole story works. So if you do real analysis and complex analysis, you will see very different behaviors. So real analysis is like completely insane and you have like really difficult functions and you need to be very careful what you define where and a lot of counter examples. Complex analysis on the other hand, everything is just really, really smooth, everything works out, everything is extremely rigid. And you kind of see the same pattern repeat all the time as you go along in your studies. Um, if you do complex representation theory, for example, it looks much more like algebraic geometry or combinatorics. If you do real representation theory, so with the real numbers, then it looks much more like analysis, actually, like, like classical functional analysis and something like that. Similarly, if you study real manifolds, then it looks a lot like topology. And a lot of topology is motivated from the study of real manifolds. If you study complex manifolds, things change and it looks way more like algebraic geometry. Kind of the strange difference between the real numbers and the complex numbers. It kind of turns up everywhere. Um, I will come back to that as we go along, but now let's have a look at this M M MMP, the maximal modulus principle, which is again completely insane like a, a, a completely insane fact about um, holomorphic functions. So remember, holomorphic is like complex differentiable, which implies that it's automatically analytic. It's completely insane. Uh, anyway, so it's kind of the right notion of a map between something with a complex structure. And this maximum modulus principle implies that if, well, it's essentially, yeah, you can't have a, a maximum value on a nice compact set. So here, for example, on a nice open set, so here, for example, um, the cosine will take its maximum value on, on this open disk, not on the open disk, but on the closure, so on the boundary of the open disk. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use green on blue. Green on blue looks a bit strange. So what looks good on blue? Red, I guess. So the maximum of this function here, absolute value, is not obtained in the interior. It's obtained on the boundary. And that's, that is not a coincidence. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you have this property in some neighborhood, then it's automatically a constant. It's kind of a really strange thing that n doesn't happen for real functions, but it does happen for those holomorphic functions. So the MMP is kind of, again, one of those strange behaviors where you really see this difference between the real world, the real world, the world of real numbers, the real world, yeah, <laughs> sure, the real world, the world of real numbers and the world of complex numbers. And again, real geometry is very different from complex geometry. It's kind of kind of a little bit strange. But anyway, so this is how things start here. And yeah, so in particular complex manifolds, 
So where the gluing maps, the atlas maps, are defined using um, holomorphic functions are, are, are strange compared to usual manifolds. So if you don't know what a manifold is, it doesn't matter. You could think of a torus. Uh, that's, that's enough for today. You could think of a torus. You could think of a sphere. Uh, you could think of the space itself. So R to the n is a standard example of a real manifold. C to the n is a standard example of a complex manifold. Similarly, sphere, torus, whatever. Think of Riemann surfaces. People usually call them Riemann surfaces. Anyway, think of a certain type of surface. And the difference between the real world and the holomorphic world is one of them is defined by real functions, the other one is defined by holomorphic functions. And this changes the game a lot. I hope this is by now kind of a good mantra to keep in mind. Real geometry, complex geometry, kind of different. And it kind of changes the game. Um, the crucial example is, for example, the torus has just one structure as a real manifold. It's just, it's just a swim ring. Yeah? Oh, by the way, fun, structure, fun, fun story here. A lot of people say the torus is a donut. So the torus is this little object here. Um, but actually the torus is hollow. And I certainly would be pretty pissed if I buy a donut and it would be hollow. So it's more like a swim ring type of object. Anyway, whatever. The torus has just one structure of a real manifold, but it has many, many different complex structures. Um, they usually call something like elliptic curves. And this mostly comes from the fact that complex maps are a little bit strange. Right? So the example here in the middle is kind of crucial. Any holomorphic function on a torus, on a compact, connected, complex manifold, is constant. So what I mean is, I have a function for my, I think I will call it m in a second, to it here, and it's holomorphic, and my m is compact, connected, complex, then this function is trivial. Essentially, it's constant. This is really strange. This is really, really, really strange. And it's very different from the real world. Again, real analysis and complex analysis, real geometry and complex geometry, real representation theory and complex representation theory, real X and complex X, they kind of play different worlds. And it's a bit surprising because this, the real numbers, complex numbers look very, very similar, but they're not. So here, really crucial, kind of the crucial observation and motivated the definition of sheets in the end is that if you study real manifolds like a sphere or whatever um, it's usually a very good idea to look at the, the smooth maps from m to the ground field uh, this space to have, appears everywhere it's extremely crucial and tells you a lot about the manifold itself but what we just had is if you want to do the same with a complex manifold let's say, uh, the holomorphic maps, then this is trivial because everything is just constant. So and this, this whole way of studying uh, manifolds, uh, the real manifolds, just doesn't work in the complex world. It just, it's just different. It's just really, really strange. So people needed to come up with a better strategy of doing this. And essentially what came out um, is the definition of sheaf, which I'm going to really just sketch give a glimpse on the next slide and as we go along i will give you then well not in this video kind of the next video the real definition whatever that is in quotation marks of a sheaf but keep this kind of flaw if you want the problem in mind that complex functions are kind of a little bit too rigid to really tell you a lot about the underlying object as it stands and the way to deal with this, um, or a whale, way, a, a whale, a whale to deal with it, deal with this, uh, a way to deal with this is to have the option of varying the domain of your map. And this is maybe not certainly what you see on the screen right now works for real manifolds as well, but it's not as crucial as for complex manifolds. For complex manifolds, we really want this ability to vary the domain of, of the definition of our, of our various functions. It's really good for automorphic ones. Okay, so the definition of a sheave in a limited way, <laughs> in just whatever I write down, just as a, as a primer on what a sheave is supposed to be, is just a collection of functions satisfying some condition, uh, holomorphic, continuous, whatever, something like that, and you want this collection, you want to vary the domain, so you want to have it for all open subsets. Okay. And okay, that's just a collection. So you need some, some probability condition between the various collections that you have 
And the culpability is, for example, that it could enforce something like uh, restrict its behavior nicely with respect to restrictions. So whatever I have marked in green, I probably should give it a, a different color. Uh, whatever I have marked in blue is just really just a collection of functions to appreciate if it's a bit close to other restriction. So they are kind of nicely glued together over the restriction of functions. And a pre sheaf is a sheaf if you can build things together from open subsets. And this is it's kind of this one. Um, it's kind of looks a little bit, well, it looks reasonable, but it really comes from this little observation to keep in mind for later that I skipped, because the identity theorem that we had actually implies that holomorphic functions on small enough neighborhoods behave like holomorphic functions on all of space. And now if you can think of a sheaf as being glued together from small pieces, then you already have some form of topology here going. So a sheaf is really just this. It's defined, so the axis is kind of a local condition and you can glue things together from smaller pieces. For example, continuous is a local definition. Constant is not a local definition. So continuous will, conti x being continuous gives you a sheaf. X being holomorphic gives you also a sheaf. X being constant, you need to vary. Uh, you need to vary the definition a little bit to make it into a sheaf. Right now, right now it's not. Anyway, so my uh, light green box is kind of the crucial thing here on the slide. This enables us to deal with functions in varying domains because now we have something associated to every open subset. And we glue them together in a certain way. And we will beef that up and make it even nicer and more algebraic uh, in the next video. But for now, I hope this is kind of a good motivation to do it. So globally, holomorphic maps are usually pretty shit, but they could be locally very exciting. And now we have some, we are looking for some way to deal with local information all at once. And the point is, and it took me a long time to realize that because I'm not a native English speaker. And I was always like, sheaf is probably just some, some mass terminology that doesn't, it doesn't play any role, uh, that doesn't come from the real world. It actually is a real world concept. Uh, a sheaf is this shit here, in case you have seen that, a little bit old fashioned, probably nowadays you won't see that so often anymore. But anyway, um, it's it's something bound together, right? bound together in a nice way. And the mass sheaf is exactly the same. We are bounding together those FUs in some way or form. And the, the, the emphasis on, on we bound them together. They're not just collecting stuff. <laughs> they are collecting stuff, but not randomly, completely unrelated. But they are bound together in some nice way. And this is where the notion of a sheaf comes from. Again, it took me a long time to realize that sheaf actually is a word that exists outside of mathematics. It does, and it actually makes sense. It's kind of something bound together uh, nicely. Okay, so without giving you any definition of a sheaf today, I hope that it was a good primer on what a sheaf is supposed to be. Something bound together nicely. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.